grace and peace in Jesus, our Savior, in God who gives growth. Isn't that a great hymn? It's one of my favorites. Beautiful. Especially that last stanza, finish thy new creation. That's our prayer. That's what God's intent is, the God who gives growth. I have some questions for you. It's not a quiz, okay? But I would appreciate playing along. Take out a pen, pencil, chair in front of you. You can write these answers down on your bulletin or in the sermon summary form. Write down some names. Here's the first question. Who first introduced you to Jesus? Maybe it was a parent, grandparent, teacher. Who first introduced you to Jesus? Write that name down. Next question. Who else has helped you grow as a follower of Jesus? Now, this could be a very long list. Just put down a few names. Maybe some of the most prominent ones are someone who's helping you now. Who has helped you grow as a follower of Jesus? Got a few names. And how about this next question? Who are you helping to grow now? Who are you helping to grow as a follower of Jesus? Could be a very long list. Could be a short list. growth. Okay, keep that list handy. Now, if we were doing this in a, in a Bible study or a workshop, then I'd have you turn to your neighbor and share your list. We're not going to do that right now, but I'd encourage you, these lists. And if more names come to mind while we're talking today, write them down. At, at, at lunch today or brunch or whatever, with family or friends, talk about this. Share these names. Probably be some interesting stories you can share with each other but also talking about growth. Our main text today, our memory verse today, is 1 Corinthians 3, 6 to 7. Let's read it together. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. It's a picture Paul is painting here for us, a a, a metaphor using agriculture, using growth, and referring to think of all the different people in your life who've been a part of your growth, but Paul's pointing out it's actually God, right? God has been at work, this beautiful paradox, God at work, but God The choice that God made, the intention God put before the world back in the Garden of Eden when he said, I'm only going to save, I'm only going to do my mission, I'm only going to be redeemer through my people. Not going to do it without him. So God still today growth only through people. So that's the picture Paul's putting before us here. It's an an agricultural metaphor here of of planting and then a a seedling and then growing to maturity. Now, we're in an agricultural area, but this picture doesn't quite mesh with our main agriculture because uh, vineyards are perennial. We don't plant them in the spring. They start growing in the spring. Now, uh, coming here from, uh, from the Midwest, you know, spending years in Iowa and Indiana and Ohio, Oh, yeah, we get this, you know, because every spring, planting the corn, and then it starts to grow. And I was thinking about this this past week, every 4th of July, this expression keeps jumping in my head, knee high by the 4th of July. If you're from the Midwest, you know what that's about. The expectation, the hope is that by 4th of July, the corn is going to be at least knee high. 
Uh, they still say that, but I don't know whether it's the kind of corn we grow today, but it's always about this high by the 4th of July. But anyway, knee high by the 4th of July, so, because it's supposed to grow and keep growing and growing to where you have finally a crop, a harvest. And that's what God's will is all about for us, an abundant harvest, that there is growth that involves many people, but ultimately is about yielding fruit, yielding a harvest. This is an ongoing work, an ongoing work in each of our lives, and we call it discipleship. That's what discipleship is, this growth in being more like Jesus, this growth in being like him. What would my life look like if Jesus was living it and blessing others, blessing God's creation, and giving glory to God. Now, why is Paul talking about this? We just pulled that verse, those verses out, but there's a context here. Why is Paul talking about growth and the participation of numerous people in growth? Well, let's review what's going on in Corinth. You heard it. Paul referred to it pretty bluntly in our our second reading. The Corinthian situation that we've been focusing on since we started this and we'll be focusing on it throughout this letter is the church was a mess. And the main issue going on was a lack of unity. They were not unified. That comes up in a variety of ways throughout the whole book. And he's addressing it right up front in these first few chapters as it's manifest in the factionalism that's taking place. What's happening to review is they are allowing the values of the Roman Corinthian culture around them to come into the church and affect and change and dominate how the church lives. They were not walking in the wisdom of the cross. They were not walking in the wisdom from the Spirit, as Pastor Mark has described last couple weeks. They thought they were, but they weren't. They were walking in the ways of Corinth. And Corinth, as we've talked about, highly competitive, ambitious, socially climbing, trying to climb, free for all kind of a place, seeking to upwardly advance themselves by attaching themselves to the right patron, the right sponsor, the right influential person who was known for being influential because of their wealth, but also because of their wisdom, Corinthian wisdom, which has to do with knowledge and rhetorical oratorical skill. As we've talked about, the orators were the rock stars of this time. So they brought that into the church, and that's what's happening here, where some are saying, well, my Paul faction is better than your Apollos faction. Oh, my Cephas faction is better than both of yours because we are wiser and we have greater gifts. And it's it's the, the ambitious, competitive Corinthian culture coming right into the church. They were acting like good Roman Corinthians instead of people of the cross who lay down their lives for each other, who lay down everything for the sake of the unity of the church, because that means it's for the sake of the mission and for the cross, who forgive one another and care for one another. So it's, that's what's going on. And so what Paul is pointing out here is, hey, wait a minute. Apollos and I, we're not faction leaders. We're not playing this game. We're just workers. And it's not about advancing yourself status either in the Corinthian culture or in the church. It's about the growth that God gives. That's what matters here. And like me, Apollos, we're just workers. We're just workers. That's all we are. Growth is what is important. And others play a role in that, as in our lives. If you look at your list, many people have played a part in your life in your spiritual growth. It could be pastors, teachers, a book. It could be a chance encounter you had on an airplane and a conversation that really helped you grow. All of these used by God to help us grow. 
So Paul brings up this point about multiple people involved in growth for this reason, to, to point out that it's not about position. No, not at all. But there's another reason to talk about growth and why Paul brings it up. Growth and then later on building. The Corinthians needed it. They need growth. Badly. They were infants. They were a cornfield, if you will, that was knee high in October when it's time for harvest. Imagine a cornfield where the corn just gets knee high and doesn't grow any further, doesn't mature, doesn't produce any corn stalks, doesn't produce any corn, any fruit. That's what Paul's saying about the Corinthians. They need growth. And he does pretty blunt language. Look at these words again. Brothers and sisters, now I'm using the new NIV here, a little different than what we read. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit. Well, that's what we've been hearing about the last couple of weeks, what it means to live by the Spirit. Wisdom of the cross, wisdom of the Spirit. And I say, I can't, I can't talk to you that way. You're not doing it. But as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. Now they're still in Christ. He's talking to them as Christians. The grace of God is for them. Jesus died, rose again for them. The Spirit has come to them. They are part of the family. They have God's grace. They are sure of the new creation. But they're infants. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you're still not ready. That's pretty harsh. There's an expectation of growth. You know, we have been blessed so richly. We have the grace of God, so undeserved, so over abundantly wonderful, giving us a new creation, giving us forgiveness, giving us the spirit, giving God's presence, all of that. But his love is such that it's even bigger than merely giving it, but also reshaping us, transforming us to be more and more like him. So there's the expectation of growth, and Paul's saying, it ain't happening. And here's the evidence. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? In other words, you are, you're just being Corinthians. You're being like the culture that is outside of Christ. The fact that I can look at this church and there's quarreling and bickering going on, you're infants. You're not applying what it means to be in Christ to something very, very, very fundamental. And that's how you get along with each other. Come on, he's saying. Are you not acting like mere humans? Now, the word he's using there, translated here, mere humans, and our one we read is mortal men, Re understand unbelievers. That's what he's saying. Okay? Are you not acting like unbelievers? For one says, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. Are you not acting like unbelievers, spiritually immature, not living as the body. What would Paul say about us? What would he say about our cornfield, about our vineyard? I said it a couple weeks ago, I'll say it again. Paul didn't pull punches we shouldn't hear. We have a lot of infants. There's a need for growth. Tremendous need for growth. There's a need for growth. Here, here's the test on is there a need for growth in your life? Are you breathing? Okay. That's the overall test. But here, is my life, are my values, are my interactions with others, is my basic handling of the stuff of the world, my, my, my welfare, my, my uh, wealth, I say, my interactions, my job, how I, am I doing it shaped by the one who went to the cross for me? We 
need to grow. This is discipleship. So then Paul changes metaphors. He actually changes metaphors several times in these 17 verses. Talk about infants to an agricultural, and now he switches to building and construction. And here he introduces something else that's really fascinating, and that is accountability. Accountability for growth. We will be held accountable to the Lord for growth, for how we build on the foundation in Christ. What he says, starting in verse, verse 10. But the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, we got the foundation in Christ. By God's grace. Then going on. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, woods, hay, or straw, he's going decreasing in value, decreasing in quality. Their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, the day when Christ reappears, the day of judgment, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. There's a lot there. And it's a hard teaching, but an important one about the importance of discipleship and growth. You see what he's saying? It's not about the accountability and judgment. It's not about losing salvation, losing the grace of God. We have been blessed to be his children. The cross cannot be taken away. The resurrection cannot be taken away. The spirit given to us. Okay. But we are held accountable for how we build on that foundation. It's very clear about it. We're talking about reward, whatever that means. It's still by God's grace, but a reward for a good building. And suffering loss. For not. That's how important discipleship is. And I must push back against the temptation of, of taking the grace of God as cheap grace. I have Jesus. My salvation is assured. Why do I need to do anything else? Why do I need to grow? Why do I need to go to church? Why do I need to be part of a congregation? Why do I need all that? I've got Jesus. I'm done. It's a satanic lie. That's how important discipleship is. Not being a spiritual infant. Not being a, a knee-high corn plant. But growing in the marks of discipleship as we've been talking about. Growing as a child of God and bearing fruit, blessing to others, blessing to God's creation, a blessing to our Savior. So then Paul puts before them the vision of what they really truly are. And we've talked about so much of the Christian life is really a matter of be who you are. God, by his grace, has declared us to be something. And now our life is about trying, by his grace, to live up to that. Who are we? What are they? A temple. A temple. Okay. Look at this little bitty Corinthian church and living, meeting in a house church with all of its troubles. And Paul says, you are a temple. You are a temple. Not the building, but you, people. He's gone from infancies to the temple. Look what he says. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. Whoa. 
I said Paul doesn't pull punches in this, in this letter. What's he mean here? Anybody destroy God's temple? I'll tell you what, he's not talking about persecution. He is not talking about outside forces pushing against the church. He's talking about the church from within being destroyed by not giving attention to growth and discipleship. A lack of helping each other to grow. Now notice, I like, I like this translation. It brings out something that's important. You together are that temple. The word Paul uses there is a plural, second person plural, you together. Later on, he's going to talk about us individually being a temple. That comes up in chapter 6. But here, it's us together as the people of God. We are the temple. That's what's being built. So we are a cornfield seeking to grow to maturity. We are a building rising up to being finished. We are a temple where God and humans come together, where heaven and earth are one. But you see, by wording it this way, Paul's bringing out a very, very important point. This is not just about how we are building ourselves. Although that's a big part of it. Me growing in the marks of discipleship. Me growing spiritually. How am I growing? And maybe that's been on your mind as I've been talking. How am I growing? How are you growing individually? But Paul's picture here is bigger than that. How am I participating in the growth of others? You see, that's not just the pastor's job. It's not just the staff's job. It's a job of the whole body. The whole St. John's community. We are responsible for each other's growth and to each other. To work together for our growth. To grow from infancy to being a spiritual temple. Now, we've been talking about the Corinthian culture and how it was coming into the church and undermining what Paul had done and what the church is about. And we talk about how, you know, our American culture, our American culture, there are parts of it that are doing that to us. And right here we go face to face with something that's really big. That is our individualism. I talked about a couple weeks ago. The individualism of our American culture run smack against what the church is all about and who we are. You see, our culture today looks at faith and religion as being a private, individual, therapeutic, devotional aid for those who feel they need it or are interested in it as a hobby. Now, that was a mouthful. But that is how the culture looks at religion, Christianity in particular, is a personal, private, devotional aid for those who need it or who want it as a hobby. Church is a hobby, a private matter. So my decisions then regarding, this is how it affects us, my decisions then regarding my spiritual life are based on how it benefits me. When I was talking about being accountable for building, for accountable for growth, were you thinking about your own growth or the growth of the people around you? See? That's, that's the American individualism shaping how we think about church. Who are we? We are a body. We are a community. We work together. We serve together. We grow together. We share responsibility for each other. At least we're supposed to be. That's what a church is. What this means for us, we think about the things that a church does differently. What are we doing now? Worship on Sunday morning. We're here. You are to be here. I'm to be here. Not just for my spiritual growth, but for each other. Recognizing that my presence and the encouragement, the interaction, the singing together, the praying together, is about the growth of all of us. And so my decisions on, do I go to worship? 
are not just about, do I feel a spiritual need for it? I'm part of a body. I'm responsible for the people of St. John's. I need to be there. Growing together in a small group. Joining a small group, joining a small Bible study, small group Bible study. Is that just about I need to grow spiritually? On one level it is, but it's also my presence. My presence, my input, my discussion, my prayers, my fellowship will help others grow. And I'm being held accountable for how well I do that. Working, serving together in the community around here. Now it's easier to see how that's for others, but also amongst us as we work together. The encouragement, the fellowship, the serving is about growing each other. You see, that's the church. You together are a temple. It's not just my corn stalk. It's the cornfield. It's not just my vine. It's the vineyard. And I am called to grow and to participate in the growth of others. I want to give a heads up about a major opportunity for us putting this into practice. Um, this fall, we're going to be doing a, a worship series that involves a small group um, element as well, a small group campaign, if you will. It's going to start end of September and run through the beginning of November, seven weeks. We're going to be focusing on the I Am statements of Jesus. And we'll be talking about those on Sunday, but also we're going to be in small groups during the week with a video-based lesson discussing, sharing, seeking to grow, but also seeking to serve. Okay, that's coming up. We'll be talking more about that in the next couple of months. And I really want to encourage you to be part of it as we together seek to grow. I'm going to be looking for people to host those small group gatherings. I'm not saying to teach, not necessarily being a Bible study teacher, but to host, being hospitable. We have no shortage of hospitable people in the Napa Valley. We're very hospitable. We need, we need people to host those gatherings in their homes. We'll be talking about that uh, coming up. So start praying about that. It's a way for us as the body. We've got to grow. We have to grow. We have been blessed by a God who wants to be growing in us, but has promised he's going to do it through each other, through us. So the questions we need to be asking ourselves is not just how does God want me to grow, but how is he calling us to grow? And how is he calling me to help others grow? These questions. Think about them. Writing down names. Talk about it at lunch or brunch today. And give thanks. Give thanks to God for the person who introduced you to Jesus. Give thanks to God for the people who've been part of your growth and are still part of your growth today. And give thanks for the privilege of being used by the God who gives growth to be the privilege of being part of the growth of others. And above all, give thanks to God who makes things grow. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, I thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your grace for calling us as your own, for giving us new birth, for giving us a place in your cornfield, a place in your vineyard, for giving us, Lord, to build on your foundation. We praise you, Lord, for the cross, for the resurrection, and your abundant grace, which is showering upon us continually. Lord, we praise you that we are a part of a body, that we're not alone, and that we have the chance to grow because of your work in other people's lives. And we have a chance to help them to grow. Lord, be at work in us. Help us, plural, to grow by your grace. In Jesus' name.